So the equation for hyperbola we learned yesterday, if it's a horizontal hyperbola, then it would be x minus h squared over a squared minus y minus k squared over b squared equals 1. And if it's vertical, then it's y minus k squared over a squared minus x minus h squared over b squared equals 1. And we said the a is always where? Oh, I'm sorry, in the equation. Yeah, on the, on the, this is first, right? Um, and that's the difference between, or one of the differences between the hyperbola and the ellipse, right? Ellipse, the a is bigger. Hyperbola, it's the first one. Uh, the other difference is the minus in between, obviously. Um, and then the other difference was the relationship between c squared and a squared and b squared, right? So for a hyperbola, it's c squared equals a squared plus b squared, whereas for an ellipse, it's a squared minus b squared. So this is find the standard form of the equation of the hyperbola with foci negative 1, 5. So if I plot what they give me, negative 1, 5, that's a foci, and negative 1, 1. And then vertices at negative 1, 2, and negative 1, 4, right? Yeah. And those are your vertices. So already, just by looking at this, you can tell me what? It's vertical, which means I'm going to follow the y squared minus x squared equation. What else can you tell me? Good. Center is halfway between either set of those points, which in this case is negative 1, 3. What else can you tell me? It's vertical, yeah. What else is that graph showing for the points? A is 1, and how do I know that? Good. Center to vertices is your A, which in this case is 1. One more piece of information from this graph. C is 2, and I know that because it's center to foci. Okay, so then the only other piece of information I need to figure out is B. So if C squared equals A squared plus B squared, and C is 2, and A is 1, then I get 4. 4 equals 1 plus b squared, and b squared would equal 3. Now I have everything I need. So I didn't have to graph it, but for most of us, the graph helps. So I would encourage it. Otherwise, you're doing a lot of trying to figure out in your head. And then we said it's vertical, so it is a y minus the k, which is 3 squared, over a squared, which we just said a was 1. This is 1 minus x minus the h squared. h is a negative 1, so that becomes a positive 1, over b squared, which is 3 equals 1. You don't need the 1 in the denominator for the y. If you have it, it's fine, okay? So either answer works. You can either have it like that or without this 1, it's still a hyperbola. Questions on that one? All right, to put the equation into standard form, identify the center, the vertices, the foci, and the asymptote. So I've got to Get this into standard form by doing what? Complete the square. So I'm going to group it. 9x squared minus 18x, negative 4y squared plus 16y, and then bump that 43 to the other side. From here, take out the 9x squared minus 2x. Leave that space. This place, I'm taking out a negative 4, which means that 16 becomes a negative 4. So be careful because that's a common mistake. Take the 2, divide it by 2 squared, it's 1. I'm going to add the 1 here, but multiply it by 9 before I add it to the other side. 4 divided by 2 is 2. 2 squared is 4. Add the 4 here, multiply it by a negative 4 this time before I add it to the other side, which means I'm actually going to subtract it from the other side. So I factored the left. This would be 9x minus 1 squared minus 4y minus 2 squared. This is 52 minus 16, which is 36. One more step to get it in the standard form, which is what? Good, divide everything by 36. So x minus 1 squared.
squared over 4 minus y minus 2 squared over 9 equals 1. There's my parabola, I mean my hyperbola, sorry, in standard form. Now I've got to get the center, the vertices, the foci, and the asymptotes. So center is opposite what follows x, opposite what follows y. Is this vertical or horizontal? Horizontal, horizontal because the x comes first, right? Which means I'm going, so I can either, one, two, plot my point and go right and left the a. So if a squared is 4, then a is 2. And if b squared is 9, then b is 3. So I'm going right and left my a. I can either use my points on my graph to plot it, or I can add and subtract 2 from the x-coordinate of your center, which is 1. So I'd get negative 1, 2, and 3, 2 for my vertices. For the co-vertices, I'm now going up and down B. So my X stays the same, but my Y, which is two, I add and subtract three from. So one, or two minus three is negative one, and then two plus three is five. Those would be my co-vertices. The foci comes from adding and subtracting C. So I've gotta use these to find it. C squared would equal a squared plus b squared, c squared equals 13, so c equals the square root of 13. So again, this is horizontal, which means to my x, I'm adding and subtracting the square root of 13, so one plus and minus square root of 13, two would be my foci. And then the last piece of information I need is the asymptote. So we said it's y equals k plus and minus, if it's vertical, I'm sorry, if it's horizontal like this one, b over a times x minus h. So y equals the k, which is the x, y corner of your center, which is 2, plus and minus b, which is 3, a, which is 2, x minus h, which is 1. So all of this is what you need to answer that question. And again, you could use the graph, you don't have to. Most of you are, I would say probably, you know, a good portion of us are visual learners, so it helps us to graph it. So you could have done that. I could have gone from my center to the right two, to the left two to get my vertices up three, down three to get my co-vertices, and right square root three, 13, sorry, which I would approximate to be like 3.5, 3.5 and 3.5, and I would know that my Hyperbola will look something like that. Questions on that one? Okay, and then three, identify the type of conic. So these are the easy ones, right? I just have to identify A and C. What is A? Nine. Nine. What is C? Eight. Negative four. Product would be A, negative 36. And if the product is negative, what kind of ellipse? I mean, what other kind of conic is this? Hyperbola. Don't get that question wrong. It's super easy. It's probably the easiest one on your whole test. Questions on what we covered yesterday? Okay, so we're going to skip four. We'll go back to it tomorrow because that's what we're going to learn today. So 9-3 part two is covering the rotation of conics. So what happens when we take these conics that right now either have a horizontal axis or a vertical axis and we rotate them around my unit circle? So a rotation, in order to rotate these, there's going to be an xy term, and we have to get rid of it. So we're going to use a procedure called the rotation of the axis to eliminate that xy term. The objective is to rotate the x and y axis until they're parallel to the axis, the axis of the conic. And the rotated axes are denoted as that little x with the apostrophe, which is called x prime. That little apostrophe is read as prime in math. And the y, again, little apostrophe, which is read as prime. So those are going to be your rotated axes. So if you look at the drawing that's there, obviously you've got your standard x and y axis. That's your regular one. And then the rotated one, which these look like they're rotated like maybe like 30 degrees, you'll denote those by your x prime and your y prime. Okay. So if it said to rotate at 30 degrees, I'm rotating it counterclockwise, just like your unit circle, 
30 degrees. If it said 45 degrees, I'd make my x-axis go to 45 degrees, 6 degrees, 90 degrees, and so on and so forth. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is just plot a point and then rotate it. So it says the x prime, y prime coordinate system has been rotated theta degrees from the x, y coordinate system. The coordinates of the point are given. Find the coordinates of the point in the rotated coordinate system. So it says theta is going to get rotated 90 degrees and the point's 4, 0. And I want to figure out, I'm not going to move the point, but I want to know what it would be if I use my rotated axis as my axis. So the first thing you're going to do is plot your point. So 4, 0 would be to the right 4 and not up or down at all. We can agree upon that, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if the axis is what it is, that's what it looks like. But this is saying rotate your axis 90 degrees. So if my initial x is here, where would be my 90 degree mark? Where's 90 degrees? Pretend this is my circle on top of my rectangular coordinate grid. Up at the top. So we're saying instead of it being there, rotate it 90 degrees and put the x prime all the way up there at the top. Now herein lies the hard part, which you're going to have to get used to actually rotating whatever it is in front of you. So for homework, you're rotating your, your iPad, but for your test, you're probably going to rotate your, like just take your test and turn it. So if I do that, if I actually take and turn this, I want to turn it so that my X prime is now where my original X is. And so my rotated axis would be this is X prime and this is Y prime. And from that view, what would you tell me this point coordinates would be? Zero, negative four. Does everybody see that? So physically take your iPad and turn it so that wherever your X prime is, is where it should be, where your normal X would be. And then relocate, you're not moving your point, you're just renaming where the location is. So if I said to rotate 45 degrees, let's say, go back to where I was initially, my 45 would be about here, right? I'd make that my X prime, and then I'd rotate my axis so that it's where the X is usually, and the Y prime goes perpendicular to it, and that's what it would look like, okay? So that point would now be in my fourth quadrant. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay, because that's the basics of what we're going to do next. So that's just finding the point. Wrote all over it and rotated all over it. Okay, so now comes the fun part. And by fun, I mean super tedious, long, and easy to make mistakes, so be careful. Okay? Is rotating the axis on an equation. So you're going to get given an equation in second degree, like a general second degree equation, which will be something like this, which means it's going to have x squared, y squared, and some of them, x, well, it has to have an xy term in order for it to be rotated. And we have to figure out where the, the angle is being rotated to, change the equation so that it would be in standard form, and then graph the standard equation on your rotated axis. So what we need from this equation is your A, your B, and your C. So we remember we said yesterday that the A is what's attached to the X squared term. The C is attached to the Y squared term. So just like we used yesterday to classify these. The B is attached to the X, Y term. So if you look back on any conic we've done so far up to this point, there was never an X, Y term. Right? When we grouped it, even when it was standard form and we grouped it and we did complete the square, there was never an XY term. That's what causes a rotation to happen. So when there is an XY term, it's a rotated axis. So that's the first thing you're going to do. You're going to identify the A, the B, and the C. And then you're going to find the rotated angle. So this is kind of like step one, figure out A, B, and C. Step two, use this equation to find what theta would be. So I do A minus C over B. I'm going to get from that a ratio. I use my unit circle, which I'll show you in a minute, to figure out what 2 theta would be. 
And then I'm going to divide by 2 to get just theta because that's a multiple angle. That's going to be where your axis is going to get rotated to. So the first thing I do is identify what theta is. Then step three is figure out what x and y are. So we're replacing x with x prime times the cosine of theta minus y prime times the sine of theta. And we're replacing y with x prime times the sine of theta plus y prime times the cosine of theta. So I told the last class that, and I'll say the same thing to you guys, I'm pretty sure that like analytical gets Step three, those equations, I'm going to confirm it with Miss Boyd. And if she still gives those, then I'll give those to you. Okay. But the theta, you'll have to be able to figure, you have to memorize that part. All right. So then once you get the X and Y, it's not on here, but step four is actually going to be to plug the X and Y back in the original equation. And this is the big step. From there, you'll get a conic in standard form. And then step five, rotate your axis and graph the conic. So you might be graphing a parabola, a uh, ellipse, a circle, a hyperbola, or did I get them all? On the rotated axis, which means these are now gonna be like turned. Ready? You guys awake? I know you're quiet, but are you awake? Because this is like a process you're gonna wanna watch and you're gonna wanna be with me, right, Riley? Okay. All right, so it says rotate the axis to eliminate the xy term in the equation xy minus one equals zero, then write the equation in standard form and sketch its graph. Again, this is different because we have an xy term, we haven't had an xy term up to this point. So step one, identify a, b, and c. What's a? Zero, there is no x squared term. What's b? One, b is what's in front of the x, y term. What's c? Zero. Now I'm gonna say that the cotangent of two theta equals a minus c over b. That equation came from the slide before. So the cotangent of two theta equals zero minus zero over one, which is zero over one, which is zero. So because you've learned it so many times, you know for sure, or I know for sure, that you remember your unit circle. You'll use the first quadrant. So remember that this is zero, the point here is zero. This would be pi over four. Nope, sorry, pi over six. And the point there is root three over two and one half. This would be pi over four. And the point there is root two over two and root two over two. This is pi over three. And the point there is one half and root three over two. And this is pi over two and the point there is zero, one. So we're gonna stick to first quadrant. My advice is now add on your, your tangents, right? So tangent at the zero, at the axis, tangent is zero. At the top, it's undefined. Over six was root three over three because it takes two threes to get to six. Over four is one and over three is root three. So you're going to want to know that if it's been a little while since you've looked at it and you don't remember it 100%, you want to make sure you at least study that first quadrant because you're going to use it two different ways. All right, so this little equation says the cotangent of 2 theta is 0. Well, we didn't write cotangent on our unit circle, but what, what can we use? tangent. So if I flip cotangent to be tangent, then I'm flipping the other side of the equation. So the flip of zero would be what? That was zero over one. If I flip that, what is it? So what I'm saying is that the tangent of two theta is actually the flip of that, which would be undefined. So where on my unit circle is tangent undefined? Pi over two. 
So this is not just theta. I'm not saying theta is pi over two. I'm saying two theta is pi over two. So if you remember your multiple angles, the number in between the tangent and the theta doesn't affect where you pull it from your unit circle, but it affects what happens after it. So if two theta is pi over two, how do I get to just theta? Good, multiply by half or divide by two, and I get theta is pi over four. So all that work just gets me what angle we're rotating to. The good news is there's a restricted amount of opportunities or for different kinds of questions. Obviously, if we're using the first quadrant, that answer is either going to be 0, pi over 6, pi over 4, pi over 3, or pi over 2. You just got to get to know those five options, okay? And then at the end, you'll divide by 2, which also means that it will be pi over 4, pi over 6, pi over 12, that kind of stuff. All right, so now that's step, technically like step two, find theta. Step three is figure out what x and y are. So x equals x prime times the cosine of theta minus y prime times the sine of theta. This comes from the slide before. And y equals x prime times the sine of theta plus y prime times the cosine of theta. So hopefully, I mean, the more, the, the better you know that equation, the easier it's going to be instead of flipping back and forth. But remember with x, x is cosine, so the cosine comes first. With y, y is sine, so the sine comes first. And the x gets the minus and the y gets the plus. Is the y squared or is x? No, oh, sorry, that's a prime. I wrote squared, it should be prime. Okay, so now I'm going to plug in what I know, which is what theta is, right? So I'm saying that x equals the x prime is staying as x prime because that's going to be part of my equation. The cosine of theta, we just said theta is pi over 4, minus y prime times the sine of theta, which is pi over 4. I can do the same thing on the other side. y equals x prime times the sine of pi over 4, plus y prime times the cosine of pi over 4. What's the coordinate point at pi over 4? Root 2 over 2 and root 2 over 2. So I can take and plug those in. So x is going to equal x prime times root 2 over 2 minus y prime times root 2 over 2. And y would equal x prime times root 2 over 2 plus y prime times root 2 over 2. So to e make it easy on myself, they're always going to have the same denominator. Make it easy on yourself, combine that into one fraction. So x is going to equal, and I'm going to put the root on the front. So root 2 times x prime minus root 2 times y prime all over 2. And y equals root 2 x prime plus root 2 y prime all over 2. So step one, kind of, if I combine those first two things together, is to figure out the angle or theta. Step two is to figure out your x and your y. The next step is to take those and plug them back into your original, original equation. So my original equation was x, y minus 1. equals zero. This is where, I mean, this one's kind of a little bit easier, to be honest, just because there's only two variables. You'll see on the next example, there's a lot more that you could plug into. If there was an x squared and a y squared, then everywhere there's an x, you're going to plug in the x. Everywhere there's a y, they're going to plug in the y. So for this one, I get the square root of 2x prime minus the square root of 2y prime over 2 times the square root of 2x prime plus root 2y prime over 2 minus 1 equals 0. So step 1, figure out theta. 2, figure out your x and y. 3, plug them back in. With me so far? Yeah, I told you it's going to be fun. So I could either foil out my numerators, or there's going to be two skills you learned in Algebra 1 that are going to come back to help you. And one is, 
So I'm going to kind of zoom out on that just for a second. What happens if I had x plus y times x minus y? What's the result? Foil it out. What happens to your middle terms? They go away. Think about the reverse of it's the difference of two squares, right? So if that's the case, if you have the exact same x at first term and last term, but one gets a plus and one gets a minus, then you can simply just square the first term and square the last term and put a minus between them. That's one skill you're going to use in this question specifically. The other one is what happens if you get an x plus y squared, let's say. So if I were to expand that out and foil it out, there's a shortcut that is square the first term, square the last term, and the middle, time, the middle term is two times the product of the terms. So those, two, you'll see that one come in handy on the next question, okay? So that's if you have the same terms squared, which is gonna happen when you get an x squared or a y squared. So for this particular one, if you look at your numerators, they're the same, but one has a plus and one has a minus, right? Does everybody see that? Mm -hmm. So I can use that shortcut. I can say square the first term, so square root of 2x prime squared. Square the last term, which is the square root of 2y prime squared, and put a minus between them. So my numerator is going to be the square root of 2 squared, which is 2x prime squared, minus square root of 2 squared, which is 2y prime squared. And then my denominator is 2 times 2, which is 4. Now I want to get this into a conic that's in standard form. So what do you have to do for standard form? What do we typically do with the, with this, with this, with the constant? Bump it to the other side, so I'm gonna bump the one to the other side, but I also need two fractions, right? So I'm gonna split this so there's a four with each of them. So I'd get two x prime, let me rewrite that, squared over four minus two y prime squared over 4 equals 1, and then simplify it. So it's x prime squared over 2 minus y prime squared over 2 equals 1. All that work got me my equation in standard form. What kind of conic is this? Hyperbola, right? There's a minus in between two squared terms with a minus in between. Do we see that? This is a hyperbola. So if I was just graphing this hyperbola on my actual xy axis, whoops, a daisy, my center would be 0, 0. It would be horizontal. My a squared would be 2, so a would be square root of 2. My b squared would be 2, so b would be the square root of 2, which we're going to approximate to be like, I don't know, like 1.3, because it's closer to 1 than it is 4, which means I would go right 1.3, left 1.3, because that's my a. I'd go up 1.3, down 1.3, because that's my b. I'd make my little box. I'd draw my asymptotes through the corners. And my hyperbola would look something like that. But what is the whole point of this type of problem? You're rotating the axis. So instead of that all happening on your standard xy, I have to take my initial xy, so this would be x, this would be y. I have to rotate it, whatever theta is, which theta was what? Pi over 4. So pi over 4 is about here, right? Pi over 4. This is going to be my x prime. And I'm going to rotate it. 
So this is my new coordinate grid. And then I'm gonna do everything I just did with the hyperbola, but on this grid. So my center is at zero, zero. I'm gonna go to the right 1.3, to the left 1.3, up 1.3, down 1.3, draw the little box, get the asymptotes, and draw your hyperbola. Forty-five degrees. So you are literally going to want to take your iPad and shift it, or you're going to want to take your piece of paper for your test and shift it so that it makes sense. Once you turn it, it's another approximation because it's not going to have a grid in which you can figure out where the one point three is. As obviously as you are going to have to hand draw in what your tick marks are. So if I actually compare this, if this was a piece of paper sitting in front of me then my hyperbola should actually look like this. It's pointed out at that 40 degree angle. So I will say that ha some people last year went through all the work, got all the way to the end and then forgot to rotate the axis. It's the whole point, right? So graph your, your conic to give yourself an idea what you're looking for, but then make sure you rotate the axis. You wanna do another one? Yeah. You have to do another one. All right, so rotate the axis to eliminate the xy term in the equation, then write the equation in standard form and sketch its graph. So you can cross through the xy minus 1 equals 0. I forgot to take it off from the example before. Now look how fun this one is. I've got 13x squared plus 6 square root 3xy plus 7y squared minus 16 equals 0. I have to start the exact same way. These are one of those things that is practically going to help you feel more comfortable with it. Trying to go into a test having done one of these questions once is not a good idea. So what's A? 13. 13. What's B? 6 square root 3. What's C? 7. So the cotangent of 2 theta is A minus C over B. So 13 minus 7 is 6 over 6 root 3. This is 1 over root 3 or root 3 over 3. Actually, I'm going to flip it before I even get to that because we that's the cotangent, right? Which means tangent would be root 3 over 1. Where on your unit circle is tangent root 3? pi over 3. So if 2 theta equals pi over 3, then theta equals pi over 6. Now I've got theta. Hopefully already that step is easier. So that tells me at the end I'm rotating my axis 30 degrees because that's where pi over 6 would be, okay? But it's also going to give me the information I need for the x and the y. So x equals x prime cosine theta minus y prime sine theta. And y equals x prime sine theta plus y prime cosine theta. So the point at pi over 6 is root 3 over 2 and 1 half, which I'm going to need to plug it in. So x equals x prime, the cosine there, root 3 over 2, minus y prime, the sine there, 1 half. y equals x prime sine, 1 half, plus y prime cosine root 3 over 2. And then I'm going to combine them so they have one denominator. And there's my x and y. So as far as credit goes on your test, you will get a portion of credit for each step you can get to. If you can get to the theta, I'll give you some points. If you can get to the x and y, I'll give you some points. If you can then plug it in, you get some points. If you can rotate it and graph it, you get the rest. So now I've got to plug it into my initial equation. 13x squared. So this is the square root of 3x prime minus y prime over 2 squared plus 6 root 3x 
which is root 3x prime minus y prime over 2 times y, x prime plus root 3y over 2, plus 7y squared minus 16 equals 0. So I would even say as you're doing the work, you don't have to write the x prime and the y prime every time. Just remember to make sure you put it in at the end so you know how to rotate it. Okay, so we said that when we're squaring, like if I was squaring a plus b squared, that the shortcut is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. So that's going to help me here and here. So I'll get 13 square root of 3x prime squared would be 3, and again, I'm going to leave off the prime, 3x squared, square root the last, or square the last term, so y prime squared would be y squared, and then double the product, so 2 root 3xy, oh, and that should be a negative, because it's a negative, all over 4. Then I go to the next term. I get 6 root 3. This and this. Unfortunately, this time they are not opposite terms, right? Which means I have to FOIL it out. So I get square root 3x squared plus square root 3 times square root 3, which is 3xy plus minus y times x, negative xy minus square root 3y squared all over 4. And I'll simplify that on the next round. The next one I can use a shortcut for, plus 7. This is squared, so I would do the first term squared, the last term squared, and then twice the product of the two terms over 2 times 2, which is 4. So when you do root 3x minus y squared, let's say, if I get out the primes, right? You would square the first term, square the last term, and the middle term is 2 times the product. That's the shortcut for a perfect oh, square. Okay. So I would even say at this point, everything has a denominator of 4. Multiply by 4 and get rid of that 4. So I get 13, 3x squared minus 2 root 3xy plus y squared plus 6 root 3, I'm going to simplify this, I'm going to multiply that 4 by the 16 and bump it to the other side at the same time, which is the 64 to the other side. Okay, now I've got to distribute in all of these uh, constants on the front. So 13 times 3 is 39x squared minus 13 times 2, 26 root 3xy plus 13y squared plus 6 times root 3 times root 3 is 6 times 3, which is 18x squared, plus 12 root 3xy, minus 6 root 3 times root 3, which is 6 times 3, or 18y squared, plus 7x squared, plus 14 root 3xy, plus 21, y squared equals 64. So if we've done this correctly, then our goal here is to actually cancel out the x squared term, or sorry, the xy term. So I'm going to look at those first. I've got 26 root 3 xy. I've got 12 root 3 xy and 14 root 3 xy. So negative 26 plus 12 is negative 14, and then negative 14 plus 14 cancels it out. So at least we know where a good to go as far as the xy, which means you're probably correct in the next steps. So now I want to combine my x squareds. 
so 39 plus 18 is 57. 57 plus 7 is 64x squared. 13y squared minus 18y is negative 5y squared plus 21y squared is a positive 16y squared equals 64. So my x's and my y squareds are gone. Those are all the terms on the left side. And the last thing I want to do is, to get it in a standard form, divide everything by 64. So I'd get x squared over 1, which you don't need, but you can keep it there to hold the place, plus 16 into 64 is 4, so y squared over 4 equals 1. Now I've got my conic in standard form, and hopefully you recognize from this that it would be an ellipse. My center is at zero, zero. The a squared is always the bigger with the ellipse, so the a squared is four, making a two. The b squared is one, making b one. And because the a squared is under the y, this is gonna be taller than it is wide. So from my zero, zero, I would normally count up two, down two, right one, left one, and that would be my ellipse. But I wanna rotate this axis first. So because from the beginning we we said theta was pi over 6, we're going to start by rotating the axis. So if this was x, then I'm going to go up pi over 6, which is that next line or 30 degrees, make that my x prime. I'm going to actually rotate this so you can see it horizontally. This would be my x prime. This would be my y prime. My center would be at 0, 0, and I'd go up to down to right one, left one, and connect my points to make the ellipse. Rotate it back, and that's what it would look like on your standard x, y coordinate grid. Okay, that's the rotation of this axis.